Software Engineering Radio Episode 77, Fault Tolerance with Bob Hanmer, Part 1. Welcome, listeners, to another episode of SE Radio. Um, this episode is the first of a two-part series about fault tolerance. It's an interview with Bob Hanmer. Bob has been working in the telecoms business with Alcatel Lucent for, well, a bunch of years. And he has been writing patterns about fault tolerance for a number of years at various PLOP conferences. Um, recently, actually in November, more or less right now, he has been publishing a book uh, on fault tolerance patterns in Wiley's software pattern series. And the episode we're doing here is based on his book. I think it's really, really great stuff in here and everybody should listen to this kind of stuff because it really helps to make systems more available, more reliable and obviously more fault tolerant. This is, as I said, a two-part episode. This is the first episode. In 10 days, we'll have the second episode. Have fun. So, Bob, welcome to the show. Hi, thank you very much. So, why don't we start by you inter introducing yourself a little bit so our listeners know who they're talking to. Okay. Um, or listening to, I should say. <laughs> um, I'm Bob Hanmer. I'm with Alcatel Lucent. used to be with Lucent Technologies, and before that, Bell Laboratories. The name keeps changing. The work is the same. And... For a number of years, I've been active in the, the pattern community, um, usually participating in the North America Pattern Conference. And I've been working for a number of years within the area of telecommunications and in particular switching systems and other systems that are highly available. So we always want our telephone calls to work. And so that's what led me down this avenue when I was deciding or working on patterns, this was the area that I seemed to be working in the most and seemed like a fruitful way to do it. Okay, so let's let's get into the topic. Um, I think uh, there is one underlying assumption, um, basically underlying all these fault tolerance um, discussions, and that's the, the assumption of an imperfect world, I guess. So things can fail, right? Yes, things fail all the time. Um, you go to the ATM and it decides it doesn't want to dispense any money or... The telephone call in the U.S., we get a fast, busy signal if the all circuits are busy. Um, so lots of things that are controlled by computers are failing all the time. And uh, you mentioned already a couple of typical application areas where failures are part of the, well, part of the normal case. Um, you mentioned telecommunication systems. Are there other systems that are, well, where it's important that a failure is handled in a controlled manner, I should maybe say? Well, that gets to a, a question of philosophy, and my philosophy is that, yes, everything should handle their failures and their faults and their errors um, nicely mm -hmm. so the user doesn't get bothered by them. Unfortunately, many um, suppliers of commercial software for PCs um, just assume that the users will, will stop complaining after a while, and so <laughs> they don't need to worry about the failures. The yeah. users will, will stop complaining and we'll find workarounds. Yeah. But so I think any really any domain um in particular, you know, enterprise grade systems, real time systems like you mentioned, uh, those are really prime areas for this. Let's start by discussing some of the important terms in the area of fault tolerant systems. So one of the terms probably is is the term fault since it's part of the name. So a fault is the basic defect so it's the misplaced comma or the design that didn't capture something correctly or the you know coding backwards, um, that kind mm -hmm. of thing. So the fault is the actual defect. Um, sometimes people would call it a bug. Um, I try to avoid that because I've been in many situations where actually talking about what was the fault and what was the error and what was the failure has been really useful. And if we just said the bug it wouldn't have given us the information to help debug the problem. Yeah. So, but you do say debugging and not defaulting. <laughs> That's true. You're right. <laughs> okay. Just joking. Um, you mentioned these other terms, error and failure. Uh, what, what's the difference to, to the fault? 
Right. So let's jump to failure. So the failure is actually the the observed deviation from the requirements mm -hmm. or the specification. And if there aren't requirements or specification, then you can't have a failure. Mm -hmm. So, but so the failure is like what the user perceives as being the problem, or someone has to see that it doesn't conform to the specification. Mm -hmm. The error is the incorrect state caused by the fault that can lead to the failure. So the error is something in the middle. It's a real state. It's of the system. It's not just a, you know, a transition. Um, so there is, there are errors that are in the system, but they haven't caused the externally visible failure yet. Mm -hmm. can, can you maybe give us an example where these three terms become clear to listeners? Um, well, let me give you a couple examples. Um, because some people work better going forward and some people work better grasping the concepts backwards. Mm -hmm. So for the example, starting with the fault, imagine like a robotic arm that's going to drill some part and there's a misplaced decimal point or uh, decimal comma yep. and in, in a constant. Well, and so that's the fault. And then the error is that that constant gets used to compute the number of steps that the stepper motor on the robot should take. Mm -hmm. But because of the constant, it computes the, an incorrect number of steps. That's the error. And then when the arm actually moves that amount, it becomes the externally visible failure. And so we've got the fault, which is the, co the misplaced comma. We have the error, which was the incorrect computation. And then we have the failure, which was the incorrect motion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. You know, going the other way, you know, you get that telephone bill and it's got the wrong amount on it, you know, and that's the failure. Mm -hmm. The error is that there are some charges on it that weren't yours. Mm -hmm. um, and that became, you know, the failure when you noticed it. And the fault might have been that an incorrect line identification was used in, when creating the billing record. Mm -hmm. So failures are always the things that are perceived by the well, by the user or by the environment of the system. Yes. So that's ultimately what annoys people. Yes. Okay. So there are other terms that I would typically um, associate with fault tolerance. One is that you need to be fault tolerant if you're in a reliable or highly available system. So there are those terms, reliability, availability, dependability. How do these relate to, to fault tolerance and errors and faults? Well, so fault to when I say fault tolerant systems um, or fault tolerance, I'm really talking about software and systems that are designed to tolerate faults to continue operation. Mm -hmm. Reliability and availability are the way we measure how effectively that works. Mm -hmm. And reliability is, strictly speaking, it's the probability that the system will perform its desired functionality for a specified period of time. Mm -hmm. So like a space shuttle mission has a specified period of time that it's going to be in, in space and it has to perform with very high reliability for that time. Yeah. Availability is a little bit different concept and a lot of people get them confused. Availability is the percentage of the time or the proportion of the time that the system is available to perform work. Reliability talks about for a, a finite duration. Availability talks over you know, over forever, what per percentage of time is available. Yeah. So you want things, you want things like the space shuttle to be highly reliable. You want things like the telephone network to be highly available yeah. because you always want to be able to make a telephone call. Yeah, I see the difference. And then there's some things where you really want both, like the ATM network, um, automatic teller machines. Mm -hmm. You know, you always want to be able to get cash, but you always, the bank at least, always wants the correct amount to be dispensed. Sure. So both it has to for that duration of that transaction has to really be correct and reliable and but it has to be available for service. And then combining the two and really needing the both and needing other aspects like security and safety gets to the definition of dependability. That dependability is a bigger concept and then reliability, availability, security and safety are kind of subconcepts. So dependability is basically what, what people perceive, again, as the system doing a good job and doing what the system should do. Yes. Okay. Um, is there any uh, specific relationship to performance? I mean, you said that the system has to perform correctly. Um, 
or, or is performance in that context also something we talk about like deadlines and transactions per minute and something? Right. It's well, it's both really that performance, we're both talking about meeting all the deadlines and, you know, failing to meet the deadline. That's an error yeah. or it could be a failure. Um, so that performance in that sense, we're also, if, if you're making a system that's, you know, really low performance, you only are going to work with one transaction of a minute, that kind of thing, you're probably not going to spend the time making it fault tolerant. So, mm -hmm. you know, there's some correlation there, but then there's another part, the specifications for the system and the software should identify how the system is going to behave under various workloads, mm -hmm. you know, which is the performance of the system. And so it's possible to have a performance error, such as a, an overload, you know, that's a fault and in the sense that the system is receiving more work than it can handle. And so as a result, fault tolerance can address that kind of performance error. Okay. So I think, we're now at the at the at the place where we can actually define what fault tolerance is, right? I mean, we discussed all the the building blocks. So, so what is what is fault tolerance? Fault tolerance refers to designing a system or the software for a system, and you'll find that I kind of use the words interchangeably because we're mm -hmm. talking about bigger pieces of software, not just you know one program. Yeah. But so, so where fault tolerance is talking about software or systems that are designed to automatically detect and correctly process faults and errors to keep them from becoming failures. Mm -hmm. So the goal is to, you know, stop failures and we do that by detecting and isolating and processing faults or errors as whatever we detect to allow the system to continue operation. Okay. So, so I guess the it's not just relevant for for well to to keep our listeners <laughs> listening. I mean, also those who don't build telecom systems or build software for space shuttles. Um, I guess it's it's important to have um, well to if you want to build any kind of reasonable system that having then having fault tolerance concepts in the back of your mind is probably useful, even if they might not be the primary concern. Right, I agree. So, so can you talk a little bit about the the fault tolerant mindset? What is important to keep in the in the back of your mind if if you want to build systems that have these dependability characteristics? Right. So, fault tolerant mindset is a a phrase that we started using to talk about always wondering, you know, what can go wrong here. Um, always thinking of, as you're designing something or as you're trying to debug something, you know, what could go wrong here? Why, how could it go wrong? Um, and continually asking that question. And that is what I refer to as the fault tolerant mindset, but it's really, you know, it's a frame of thought that you're always going to be worried about something failing. And so you've got, you're going to design in the correct techniques to handle that when it does happen. So there are probably a couple of specific design trade-offs you have to you have to make if you want to have a, a fault tolerant program, I guess. Right. It's definitely going to be more expensive to develop a fault tolerant piece of software, mm -hmm. and it's also going to probably take a little bit more code. Although one of the big principles of fault tolerant design is to keep it simple, because every line of code you add might you know, or every class you add or every whatever could hide other faults. Yeah. And so you really want efficient, streamlined code that does what you need to without a lot of extra bells and whistles because they may be harboring the faults. So the trade-offs, and then I don't want to overemphasize that it's going to cost, sure. you know, a lot more always, but especially if the designers have a fault-tolerant mindset. Mm -hmm. Um People sometimes, or I could, well, we could argue that a good system that has high internal quality is more or less automatically fault tolerant. Is that correct? Is fault tolerant just simply bug free or is there more to it? This, Marcus, is one of my soapboxes, unfortunately. <laughs> okay. Or, um, so this is, a. I agree, it's a really common, um, in my opinion, misconception. Sure. Software quality is concerned with how well the software is designed and built. Are good methods used like code inspections and design inspections and 
is there a repository for things, um, you know, so that people can find the design document when they yeah. need to go back and refer to it, that kind of yeah. stuff. That's quality. Mm -hmm. And so it's a quality talks about how you build the system. Fault tolerance, on the other hand, is talking about what you put into the system. So the techniques that I've written about in my book, they're all things that are being designed into the system, or the last chapter is a little bit crosses this boundary, but most of them are things that are designed into the system that allow the system to behave in a certain way that makes it fault tolerant. Mm -hmm. And so I say quality is about the art of making the software and fault tolerance is about the software itself and what it, what it does. Mm -hmm. Okay. So uh, um, another thing you, you already mentioned is that the simpler the system is, the less or the fewer chances there are for faults because the simpler the less stuff, the less faults. Um, I guess there are more things to it. For example, um, there are certainly some features of certain languages that are more susceptible to being faulty, for example, pointers. So I guess defensive programming or whatever you'd like to call this is also something that's very useful. Yes, in indeed. It's the defensive programming or the, thing, the little things that people learn slowly over in school that relate to how you design your code to be take care of itself or not have faults um and so you're you know careful with pointers you're careful with memory mm -hmm. designing data structures in certain ways such as two-way linked lists instead of singly list linked lists allow you to recreate things and and figure out what's going on better so there are a lot of things like that you know coding standards is another example mm -hmm. a lot of the defensive programming things are at the coding level. Mm -hmm. There are things that you do when you're when you're coding you keep in the back of your mind. And again, what I've put in my book are the higher level des design and architectural concepts yeah. that you can put on top and then use the defensive programming as you actually implement them. But it's the higher level things that are going to give the you know the larger system better fault tolerance. So one of these things is probably then also N version programming that you have several versions of the same thing that don't fail because of the same faults. I think that's hopefully correct terminology. Right. That's a technique that's discussed a lot in the in the literature. It's one that I didn't really include in my book because N version programming for it to really be N version programming and really be effective requires completely different design teams and design yeah. environments working off the same specification. And and that's just impractical for a lot of things unless, you know, it's a project like the space shuttle with a large budget and reliability is extremely, extremely, extremely important. Yeah, I heard about uh, or I listened to a guy once who talked about software for Airbus flight controllers and he said they have several different processor platforms and also uh, one team did it in ADA, the other team did it in C or C++. So that's probably an example of that case of N version programming. That's a perfect example of it, yes. So so before we get to, to the pattern stuff, what's the role of formal verification in all that? Is it is it practical in uh, well, is it useful in, in practice to, to actually verify a program formally and, and say something about its well its quality and or its uh, level of fault tolerance? Uh, yes, it's I think it's very important. I mean putting this stuff into the code to make it fault tolerant or, you know, putting it into the design to make it fault tolerant doesn't mean that, you know, all the simple misplaced commas and periods are out of the way. So verification is very important. And verification, you know, rigorous verification can also give you an idea about whether you're going to achieve your availability and reliability requirements. Um, and also, through the use of techniques such as software reliability engineering techniques, such as reliability growth modeling, you can actually use the results of your testing to get an idea whether you're getting the last few defects out. Mm -hmm. um, and so verification is very important. This, you know, the whole point of being fault tolerant, again, it's something about happens in execution time yep. in the system. And so you want to verify it during design time. Mm-hmm. And, and and this verification is it more manual manual review kind of stuff or is it automat automated based on tools typically? Well, I would say it would be the the whole gamut mm -hmm. of you know whatever the the project usually does in terms of quality it 
is what you need to continue. Just because you're putting it into the code doesn't mean you shouldn't, you know, design it with high quality. And I think yeah. verification is is an element of that. Yeah. But one of the things that can be done during verification is through kind of comprehensive testing, and you have to really plan the testing well and and insert defects as appropriate to get it to happen. You can get a measure of how effective your fault recovery techniques are going to be. And this is a, a results in the ability to compute the measure for coverage, mm -hmm. which is the conditional probability that the system will recover automatically from a fault that is detected, you know, given that the fault is, has been triggered and activated. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, verification can play a role in that, but it, it, again, it's a system that really has stringent availability and reliability requirements that is going to go to that extra effort of fault insertion testing yeah. right. to verify and determine what the actual coverage is. Although the specifications might give you a coverage factor to meet, even if you can't spend the time to test for it. Mm -hmm. Okay, so then uh, before we actually look at the patterns and, and their structure... Um, let's discuss a little bit about the shared context for the patterns. Um, we already talked about systems like communication systems, telecom systems, or flight control systems. So I think one of one aspect of the context is probably the well, the the yeah, obviously the the reliability and availability requirements that are that are posed against the system. What are the other shared context items here? Well, the in the patterns that I've written about. They apply to both hard and soft real-time systems or systems that aren't real-time. Um, I think if you're designing hard real-time systems, you actually have to go to a, a little bit further level than I've described in these patterns. So I'm not saying that I've put together a complete pattern language in the, for the hard real-time case. Mm -hmm. um, but there are a lot of systems out there, like even the telephone network. In many ways, it's a soft real-time system. If a you know, there's nothing catastrophic that happens when a deadline is missed. Okay, uh, we already talked about the the uh, the availability aspect. Um, is there other things like statefulness or or whatever? That was a problem that I ran into when writing the book because a lot of the patterns talk about state being important, or you want to save state to allow recovery to happen faster, but some of them don't talk about that, and. It really depends upon your design space for the system you're building, whether it is stateful or stateless. And the patterns here really apply across the board. And there's some that are really specific to stateful systems and others that aren't. And so as you go through and are in your design, you can't look at every pattern and say, oh, yes, I must use this, I must use this, yeah. I must use this. You have to really you know, be a little intelligent and and I'm a big advocate that even if, for example, we're talking about statefulness right now, even if you're designing a system that it doesn't have state that is persistent or that is needed, you might still get some nuggets of inspiration about things you should put in by looking at those patterns, yep. but they may not all apply to your case. So anyway, so kind of the shared context, the patterns... It's a mixed bag. Some talk about statefulness. Some talk about statelessness. Use them as appropriate. Okay. When I prepared that, I, I saw something called external observers. What, what does that mean? Right. Well, many of the systems in the world that are meant to be fault tolerant are meant to be left running unattended. Mm -hmm. So like a telephone switch, they're isn't someone staring at every switch watching to make sure that it isn't having a problem yeah. right now. And so the systems are designed for external observers, you know, people or other, either people or other computer systems somewhere else that are watching and monitoring their behavior. And those systems, you know, they might be talking one of the standard protocols like SNMP to put a name on one. Yeah. Um, but these are these systems are interested in reports. You know, oh, an error was detected. You know, they're interested in that because they might be doing some trend analysis to detect whether there's something that's a bigger problem than the individual system is able to determine, or maybe it's a network-wide problem. Mm -hmm. And so there's an external observer, and so that's kind of a 
as you pointed out, an underlying assumption throughout this that there are people or systems that are interested in how well, you know, an individual target system is behaving. Mm -hmm. But although we have these external observers, we still expect that the fault tolerance is whatever that means, we'll discuss it in a moment, uh, is handled by the system itself. So the fault tolerance is somehow integrated into the system. Yes, uh, it's integrated in, fault tolerance is integrated into the system because the length of the outage or the length of the failure, the duration of the failure will increase greatly even, you know, as you start adding in communication latencies or this getting this, the other system to realize that it's a problem. And so you want the system, you want the time from the detection to the resumption of normal operation to be as short as possible. Mm -hmm. And so in order to do that, you put it onto the system itself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, do we need to mention the other things like long-lived systems? Is that is that important here? Well, I'll just say about about long-lived system, which is another item that mm -hmm. because you do have to spend a little extra effort designing a system to be fault tolerant, oh, right. mm -hmm. you probably want it to last a little longer than that system that you you know tack together over a weekend. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. Sure. Okay, um, so let's, I guess, uh, look at some of the patterns in, in the book. And uh, basically, let's look at how the book is structured. It's uh, structured into several chapters, which each relate to certain phases in building a fault-tolerant system. Do you want to elaborate on what these five phases are before we then look into the patterns that are useful in each of these phases? Yes, yeah, sure. That's a good idea. So I'm going to start with this explanation of the second one, actually, I just mentioned about how you want to detect that there's an error or a fault and get it corrected quickly. And so we've got it. There's a chapter on patterns to detect errors and faults and failures. And then once you detect it, you want to recover from them and, or you want to process the error. And that mm -hmm. can either be going in one direction, which is you know, kind of grossly changing the state of the system, you know, changing the program counter, you're going to resume execution in some new place. That's what I call error recovery. And the other concept is error mitigation, where you can fix it without going to a totally different place. So like you can correct the data right where it is rather than having to transfer somewhere else. Mm -hmm. So those are the three middle parts um, before that, I've put architectural patterns because there are a number of things that you really need to design into the system to the lowest level, you know, throughout the system so that, you know, to set the, a good framework yeah. for the fault tolerance. And so the architectural patterns, I covered those first, but I wanted to mention detection sure. and, yep. the other way. And then the last of the five areas that, that you mentioned is fault treatment patterns. And this is where we start getting to some of the quality and other aspects because these patterns are helping you. Okay. You've, the system has automatically recovered from the problem. It's resumed execution. Now let's take a look at that fault that has occurred and really treat it and get it out of the system. And there's some patterns that are useful for that. Treat the root cause instead of just key, uh, coping with the problem. Exactly. Yeah. Okay, I guess uh, we should start with the architectural patterns, I guess. And, um, well, um, they're probably also more or less some of the umbrella patterns that are then, or that then uh, encapsulate some of the more detailed patterns we'll talk about later. So, um, I think the way we'll do this is that I'll just mention the patterns you, and you'll explain them. <laughs> okay. Um, so, let's start with uh, units of mitigation. Units of mitigation is is a really basic pattern and it's the first one in the book and I actually use the Alexander style so this is pattern number one and <laughs> when you're designing a system to be fault tolerant you need to decide what are the levels or what are the blocks that you will suffer a failure in is it the complete system like your complete web server goes down or is it that you can no longer access the back end in case of a failure, mm -hmm. but the other parts will continue operating? So you need to de decide, you know, in it's pattern number one, 
um, what are the units of mitigation? You know, what is the scope of what it is that you can fail things to? And this also defines the boundaries about where you will contain the errors and failures because yep. error propagation yep. is a really big problem. And so, you know, these, the units of mitigation also f- tell you what the boundaries are that you're going to contain things and quarantine things in later. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's like more or less establishing firewalls between different subnets. If one is infected, the other one is not harmed. <laughs> exactly. Okay. An example, our reliability requirements are such that you can only have one minute of you know, outage per year, for example. Yeah. And yet it takes your system two minutes to recover. Then having the whole system be the unit of mitigation isn't going to meet that requirement. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. If you assume that one, you know, one failure occurs in the year. So it's there's 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 the firewall aspect and then there's also the time aspect factor in how long it takes to do things and can you meet the deadline meet, can you meet the requirements given these boundaries that you've established mm-hmm, mm-hmm. correcting audits is the next one this is a pattern that was Well, it's very important in the systems that I've worked in, in telecommunication systems. And the point of the pattern is that you, the system is continually looking at the data and checking it in a number of different ways to determine if it's correct and if it's not correct, automatically correcting it. And mm-hmm. this pattern was one that was pretty early in the, in the book in an earlier draft. And then after listening to the comments by Ralph Johnson's U of I group as they reviewed the manuscript, I realized that to other people not working in telecom, this might be you know a really insightful pattern. So this one became number two. Mm-hmm. And some of the ways that the data can be checked is you can check the structural properties, um, like linked lists. Is it correctly linked in both directions? Yep. Um, you know, are the stack and queue pointers within bounds? Another thing you can look at is known correlations. You know, if you've got data stored in different places, maybe yep. in different formats, different representations, are they all really the same still? Mm-hmm. Do they all have the same relationship that you think that they will? Mm-hmm. You know, and another way is just a simple sanity check. Is the range within the accepted range? You know, is the year yeah. <laughs> appropriate? Uh, yeah. We won't talk about that more. And then direct Comparison. There's some data that in your system that might be so important that you store multiple copies of it, and you can directly compare them. You know, the the golden master copy that you never change and isn't in right protected memory, for example. Compare that with mm-hmm. the working copy. So that that's more or less already redundancy, right? Yes, that's already introducing some redundancy into the system. Redundancy being the next pattern, right? And The redundancy, it builds upon the unit of mitigation and tell, lets you know that there are some parts of the system where you may want explicitly to have multiple copies doing the same thing, storing the same information in the correcting audit case or performing the same computation in you know, a computational setting. But so you design in the redundancy. And redundancy helps make the system fault tolerant because... If you have a redundant copy, if you detect that there's an error in one copy, you can switch to the other copy very quickly. It makes yep. that repair time much shorter. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah. Well, assuming both are always up to date. If we look at enterprise systems, the problem is always if you have a, a standby. How do you how do you supply it with the the correct state so that it can take over one once the master copy fails? And that's a really good point. But but even if it is doesn't have the latest, sure system state, it still is going to be a little bit faster than having to con- complete the diagnosis yeah. and and then do the repair and then do the restoring of state. Yeah. You can, you know, diagnose it later and yeah. just get the system going. Sure. Um, the next pattern is a recovery block, which to me sounds like if it was related to the unit of mitigation. Is it is it basically the same thing, but now discussing what you restart uh, once something fails? It's very much like redundancy and units of mitigation, therefore. But recovery block is also one of the techniques that's widely discussed in the literature as a way to perform software, to provide software redundancy. So, you, you know, I just talked about redundancy and people might have been thinking, 
well, that's fine for hardware, but how do I do that with software? Mm -hmm. And recovery blocks give you some ideas for how to do that with software. And the idea is that you would try executing one block of code. And if, if the result met some acceptability criteria, then you would use it. And if it mm -hmm. didn't meet that acceptability criteria, you would use a different block of code. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of a cross between redundancy and version programming, which I mentioned before, yep. and a way to to implement it. Um, so it's it's a refinement of re redundancy and unison mitigation, and gives some guidance on how to do that in a software setting. Okay. And to tie it into what people might already be familiar, basically you can think about it as if you were using a, a C plus plus try catch blocks, mm -hmm. you know, it's adding in multiple tries yep. if in the within the catch. So if the first try didn't work, then you've got another one and, and so on. Mm -hmm. I think I just recently saw something like that in the tutorial on Erlang that I read. I think there is something like that where it automatically retries something else if, if something fails or something. I don't know. No, it was somewhere else. I forget it. <laughs> I'll cut it out. Well, I'm not that familiar with Erlang, but I'm not surprised because Erlang came out of the telecommunications world. And yeah. so it, it doesn't surprise me that they would try this. And like I said, this is Recovery Blocks has been widely, writ widely written about also. Okay. The next two patterns are minimize human intervention and maximize human participation. <laughs> How do these two go together in one system? Minimize human intervention is a really important pattern, I think, in a fault-tolerant system. And again, it gets to that timed for the repair. Mm -hmm. Because once you detect the problem, you have to fix it to resume execution. And if if the only option is to put a pop-up on the screen <laughs> saying, oh, an error occurred, click OK to continue, yeah. that takes a long time. Yeah. And so it's a, it's a funny example. Everyone's seen those blocks, you know, those pop-ups. And the idea of a fault tolerance system is solve the problem automatically. Don't rely on people to be there, you know, to hit the OK button, yeah. you know, immediately. So try to solve the problems automatically. But having said that, sometimes people really do know best because they can get the bigger picture or they know that, well, that, that they, we already tried that and it didn't work. And so maximize human participation is kind of the flip side, and it's saying I'll provide the means for those experienced or those knowledgeable people to actually make useful contributions to the recovery. Mm -hmm. um, so on the one hand, do it automatically because the computer is going to be faster, and on the other hand, you know, let the expert inject suggestions in to help direct how the recovery goes faster. Yeah, but, but keep them out of the critical path. Right. Keep them out of the critical path. Yeah. Okay. The next one is maintenance interface. That probably um, is related to this external observer thing. So there is other systems that are able to monitor your system. Yes. Exactly what you said. But also those people that are, we're going to allow them to participate in a maximal way. Mm -hmm. We need them to get the information to help yep. too. Yeah. And so the point of maintenance inter the ma the point of the maintenance interface pattern is to separate out the the maintenance chatter or the error reporting and the the error recovery kind of messages separate that out of the normal input output stream onto a separate stream mm -hmm. that can be monitored for that purpose because if it's in the regular stream then you know the things are going to get lost or they're going to be so other so yeah. many other messages that things will be detected yeah. and this points to a pattern language that Greg Stimfel and I wrote a couple of years ago and was published in Plop D4, which has a number of patterns for dealing with lots and lots of output. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because that's something that you easily have if you have these typical log files. It's funny, this maintenance interface just reminded me <laughs> about uh, aviation, where there is a separate frequency for for emergencies, which is always clear, so you can always speak. And if somebody says something there, it's sure that somebody is going to look at it. Something the same thing you just said. Don't make sure yep. that the important maintenance messages are not like hidden in the clutter of the usual stuff. Exactly, exactly. Or 
many telecommunication systems might have GUI, you know, web-based or otherwise yeah. primary interfaces, and they still have an extra emergency channel that's plain old-fashioned, you know, RS-232 link. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, the next one is, again, related to humans, someone in charge. What does that mean? Well, it's related to humans and it isn't. Okay. And the point of someone in charge is... If a tree falls in the woods and there's no one to hear it, you know, did it make a sound? Well, if the recovery action is attempted and it fails, is someone going to realize that and start restart it? And so someone in charge is really saying that for everything you do mm -hmm. in trying to keep the system fault tolerant, you, the designer, should know what other part of the system, and it could be the operating personnel, What other part of the system is going to be monitoring that and making sure it happens? And if it doesn't happen, initiate escalation, which is the next pattern. Mm -hmm. And so someone could be a person or it could be another part of the system. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and it's, it's basically nominate some task of the system to initiate and monitor for completion all the actions that you take. And now, There's a, a potential gotcha here, which is I'm not trying to say that you should have some sort of God entity that is going to take care of everything. It doesn't have to be on that level. It's just for everything that the system does, it should know who's in charge of that action and mm -hmm. who's interested in that. Mm -hmm. You already mentioned escalation as one way of building a hierarchy of related resolution strategies, I guess. So how does that work in, in specifically? Well, it's just exactly what you said. Um, For every action, think about, and this goes to the fault tolerant mindset also, for every action that you might contemplate to fix a particular error that might occur, okay, if that doesn't work, what do you do next? Mm -hmm. And design that into the system, design in the escalation path so that the system automatically knows, well, okay, it didn't work to, to restore this from a checkpoint. Okay, so that means we have to restart the larger entity. But mm -hmm. so predefine that escalation path, you know, during design time, so that during execution time, the recovery can be as fast as possible. Mm -hmm. Right, yeah. Fault observer is the next one in this chapter? Fault observer is that part of the system that is receiving the error reports, and it's the interested party that's, you know, hey, tell me what's going on. And I'll pass that information off to the external observers or to the other parts of the system that mm -hmm. are interested. So it's the part, again, minimize human intervention. So these are all interrelated. Minimize human intervention is talking about limiting the input or the output, rather, to the outside world and to people and relying on them. Fault observer is saying, hey, I'll take those reports for you, and then I'll make that report out to the outside world. Oh, okay. You know, and I'll also actor. give it to the logging functionality. And so it's kind of the central point for the, the information going out. And again, this is related to the, the input-output pattern language in PLOPD4 book. Mm -hmm. Okay. We'll, we'll put a link to that into the show notes. I guess you have a PDF somewhere online, maybe. Uh, I'll look for that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll figure it out. Okay, and the last one of the patterns in the architectural chapter is software update. Probably useful to replace buggy or faulty code. Exactly. Um, and it's something that even, you know, working in a telecommunications company, projects have gotten quite far into their design without thinking about how they're going to update it. But <laughs> yeah. again, fault tolerant systems are long lived. Mm -hmm. And unless you put in the hooks that you need to add in a new version in the first version, you're going to have a great difficulty sure. doing it. And yeah. so this pattern is to remind you, you need to think about software update up front. So we'll stop here for this episode. In 10 days, you'll hear about detection patterns, error recovery patterns, error mitigation patterns, and fault treatment patterns, as well as a discussion on how to design with those patterns and why Bob wrote this book. I hope you liked this episode and I hope you're looking forward to next to the next episode on this topic as much as I do. Uh, thanks for listening. Talk to you in 10 days. Bye.
Thanks for listening to Software Engineering Radio. If you want to get more information about Software Engineering Radio or if you want to give us feedback, please go to our website at se-radio.net. You can also contact the team at team at se-radio.net, although we prefer entries in our comments system on the website so other people can see what you think. Software Engineering Radio wants to thank Henning Pauli for the intro and outro music, as well as Lipson for providing the bandwidth. This episode of SE Radio, as well as all other episodes, is licensed under Creative Commons license. See the Software Engineering Radio website for details.